All right. So we continue with the, the lecture. Now I talk about fraud. Okay. So fraud is also one of the ways by which the debtor may breach an obligation to which he will be liable for damages. So Article 1171, read it with me. Responsibility arising from fraud is demandable in all obligations. Any waiver of an action for future fraud is void. Now, what is important is for you to know what fraud means. And of course, be able to identify the two types of fraud that actually uh, are recognized, are defined and recognized by the civil code. So, please note, According to the civil code, fraud implies a kind of malice or dishonesty and should not cover cases of mistake and errors in judgment made in good faith. In such case, obligor can be liable for damages. That is what the Supreme Court declared. So fraud, or sometimes known as dolo, is a conscious and intentional proposition to evade the normal fulfillment of an obligation. So I repeat, fraud or dolo is the conscious and intentional proposition to evade the normal fulfillment of an obligation. So. Here, there is really bad faith. There is intention to breach the obligation. And it is done so through deceit, through uh, what you call now uh, 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 machinations, through falsehood, misrepresentation in that regard. Now, at this point, I want you to please distinguish there are two types of fraud that are uh, defined and uh, governed by the civil code. This fraud that is referred to in 1171 is referred to as fraud in the performance of an obligation. So this is a fraud that is committed in the performance of an obligation. So obviously, in this type of a fraud, there exists already an obligation and it is in the performance of this obligation where the debtor commits a fraud. That is why it's referred to as fraud in the fulfillment of the obligation. Now, there is however another type of fraud which is in Article 13 38. All right, so please go to Article 1338 so that uh, you will fully understand what I am talking about. So, 1338 tells you the other type of fraud. Now, this other type of fraud, 1338, this other type of fraud, there is 1338. Okay. All right, is here. It's referred to as fraud in inducement. It tells you there is fraud when through insidious words or machinations of one of the contracting parties, the other is induced to enter into a contract which without them he would not have agreed to. So this is a fraud to induce, to entice, to lead someone into agreeing to a particular contract without which, without the fraud, that party, the victim, would not have entered into the agreement with the uh, uh, perpetrator of the fraud. So, what 
therefore is immediately so evident as to the distinction between the four or between the two frauds. Although both, I repeat, really involves insidious words or machination or intentional proposition to evade. So there is intention, there is bad faith in both. But what is now the clear distinction between the two? I mentioned in 1171, it is fraught in the fulfillment of an existing obligation. In 1338, however, note that there is no pre-existing obligation because it is the fraud itself that actually creates the obligation. Therefore, it is quite clear that if it is the fraud that is referred to in 1171, the creditor who may have been injured will have a cause of action both for specific performance or performance of the original obligation and damages for the fraud. Now, however, in Article 1338, the action would merely be limited to damages. There can be no possibility of an action for performance of an obligation because there was no obligation that existed prior to the fraud. Rather, it is the fraud that creates the obligation. So in this case, the, the existence of the obligation of the debtor, which is the payment of damages, is dependent on the fraud committed. In 1171, however, there will be two types of obligation. The pre-existing obligation, which existence would not be dependent on the fraud committed in the fulfillment, and the obligation to pay damages, which is now dependent on the fraud committed while in the fulfillment of that pre-existing obligation. Do you follow? Now, we will take this up again when we get to reach that provision 1338. All right? But at this moment, I believe it is very important that we point out the distinction between the two. But we will go back to this again when we reach that in the 15 contracts. All right. So what would now be the, the distinction between the two of them? Okay, now, uh, I'll repeat. So, fraud in 1171, okay? Uh, wait, uh, press. I cannot read anymore. Anyway, I will go, I will go back to this. But, in the meantime, it is sufficient that you see the distinction between the, the two types of product and there must be the proof of the intention to evade uh, the fulfillment of the obligation in accordance with its original tenor itself. Okay? That is what we mean by fraud. Intention so as to damage the creditor. All right. You will find out many or some textbooks tells us that uh, these two types of frauds are referred to as dolo causante, which is 1338, and the other is dolo incidente, which is 1171. Now, I want already to correct that. That is not the that is not correct. So it is wrong. That is wrong because when we talk of dolo causante and dolo incidente, it actually refers to the two types of fraud referred in thirteen thirty eight or 
these are the two types of fraud that are committed to induce one to enter into a contract. 1338 is uh, dolo causante, while 1344, uh, oh, look at 1344, let's see if I got the provision correct. 1344, in order that fraud may make uh, a contract voidable, it should be serious and should not have been employed by both contracting parties. So that means it should be that which is referred to in 1338. But the second second paragraph tells us, incidental fraud only obliges the person employing it to pay damages. So incidental fraud is the other type of fraud, which is also fraud to induce, but it is not that serious. When do we know that it is not that serious? In incidental fraud, as described here, as you will learn, it is one that is committed by the by the uh, 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 by, by the, the debtor, okay, by the debtor, but to which was not the one that really, you know. Uh, it was not really the, the one that, that enticed the creditor to enter into an agreement. Which means, even without the fraud, the creditor would anyway have answered into the contract. Okay, incidental fraud lang yan. That is why it is said that the contract is not defective, it is valid, but it gives the creditor the right to damages only. But if it is the uh, uh, dolo causante, if 1030 is serious, it is a fraud that is committed really that entices the creditor to enter into the contract. Here, the creditor would not have entered into the contract without the fraud. Don't say so. Even without the fraud, this creditor could, would have entered into the contract the same way or the same thing. So these are the two types of what you call uh, dolo uh, or, or fraud committed uh, to induce or uh, one to enter into a contract. Do you understand? So dolo incidente and dolo causante does not have to do anything with that particular fraud that I am referring to in 1171, which is the fraud committed in the fulfillment of an obligation. Because in Dolo, in or, or, uh, fraud committed in the performance, it is not merely to induce, because there is already a juridical tie, but rather it is more of fraud in committing the existing obligation. You understand now? Okay. So it's very important to, to determine whether the fraud committed was fraud in the fulfillment of the obligation or fraud in inducement. Why? Because as I have said, if it is fraud committed in the performance, cause of action would be, could be, Specific performance, performance, okay? If it's still possible, notwithstanding the fraud committed, and damages. But if it is fraud in inducement, whether dolo causante or dolo incidente, then it is merely damages. That is that. All right? I hope it is uh, clear already. So uh, let's give you an illustration. All right. So the most important element that the Supreme Court uh, usually stresses in order that there be what you call 
the fraud committed in the fulfillment is the bad faith, the intention, the deliberateness of the perpetrator or the debtor to commit the fraud in the performance of the obligation. The, the best example that we could give you is, of course, the case of uh, spouses Vasquez versus Cathay Pacific. But uh, this case will have already to be related to the third contravention of the tenor of the obligation. So I refer to this as Kototo. So this is the third contravention of the tenor of the obligation. Now, the issue here is uh, if the debtor in the fulfillment of the obligation commits delay, commits fraud, or even negligence, is that not contravening the tenor of the obligation? Answer, yes. So does that mean that contravention of the tenor of the obligation or kototo, kita niyo bakit? Kototo, C-O-T-T-O-T-T-O, kototo, contravention of the tenor of the obligation. So C-O-T-T-O, T-O. So kototo, but not all kototos may result to delay, fraud, or negligence. I repeat. Okay. Delay, fraud, negligence are kototos. But not all kototos would result to delay, fraud, negligence. Example. I promise that I am going to deliver to you a, a red Porsche. Red na Porsche. Okay? So, in anticipation of said delivery or thing, you prepared for it. You painted your house red, you got everything red, 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 red. Then suddenly I delivered to you a blue Porsche. Oh, wala lang akong ibang madideliver ko di yung blue. So, blue ang nadeliver ko sa iyo. So, the issue here is, is there a breach of the obligation? Yes! There was a deviation from the tenor of the obligation. The obligation consisted of the delivery of a red Porsche, but instead, I got to deliver a blue Porsche. Is that contravening? Of course, but no. Can that be considered as delay? No, I delivered on time. Is that fault? Of course not. There was no deceit. There was no malice. Okay, it just so happened that that was the only force that I could hold on and effect the delivery to you. Okay, and deceit. Uh, besides. Fraud really uh, contemplates the seed, which is patago. And there's negligence? No, it is not negligence. So, what is it? It is ko to to. Is that a basis for damages? Yes, 1170. That is what we mean by ko to to. Now, this ko to to as ground for damages is illustrated in this case of the mga spouses Vasquez versus Cathay uh, Pacific Inc. It is a very interesting case uh, because it, uh, it is about a couple who sued the airline okay, for damages. Now, not because uh, they were what you call now refused a seat, notwithstanding their confirmed seat reservation in a particular flight or downgrading, but rather they were upgraded. What I try to point out, usually passengers 
would sue an airline either because they were bumped off, which means that they had this confirmed reservation for a flight, but when they checked in, they were bumped off. Hindi sila natanggap. Hindi sila pinasakay. Yan, kakasuhan yan, breach of contract. Or, they had a reservation for a uh, uh, seat, say it's business class, but are downgraded to a lower class economy. Now, in this case, neither happened to the couple. Rather, they had a reservation for business class. They were allowed to board, so they were not bumped off. Except that it was for a business class, but the airline insisted that they be upgraded to first class. So it, the, the amenities are definitely much better than what they will get. Even the seat spacing would definitely be much wider and bigger. They could even, you know, uh, uh, sleep uh, 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 with, their, with their legs fully stretched so uh, obviously anybody will say that that is even a better deal than what they that the, that the airline was obligated to to give them in the business but the couple did not like to accept it why because their allegation was uh, they were traveling with a couple friend and business partners and they did not want to be separated from them during the flight from Hong Kong to Manila. That's the reason. But, so they did not want. But the airline insisted, sabi na, hindi, you have to take the first class because they were considered to be members of the frequent flyer club and as such one of the considerations was an upgrade every time the lower class says of which they may have booked uh, would be full so they would be upgraded so this is exactly what happened the business class of that flight was fully booked so they needed to upgrade the spouses because they were uh, frequent frequent flyer frequent marco polo members frequent flight but they did not want to accept it. but they were forced because as i said if you do not take this flight then we will not allow you to board the plane and you will miss the flight. So instead of missing the flight, they opted to take the first class back with vehement objection. To the extent that when they arrived, they sued Kasai Pacific. Now what was their allegation? They claimed damages for what? Breach of obligation, breach of contract. On what ground? They pointed fraud. Okay. According to them, they were led by Kasai Pacific to enter into an agreement right, with the promise of giving them seats with their companions in business class. But turned out they cannot, or they do not, did not want to. But rather, uh, the intention was for them to be in the first class. So they said that Kazai Pacific knew of this and they did not know anything about it. Okay. So sabi nila, they applied fraud in the fulfillment of the obligation. There was deceit, there was intention on the part of Kazai Pacific, intentional proposition to evade the Ano sabi ng Supreme Court? Or siya, sobra na bang kayo? Sabi ng Supreme Court. 
the Supreme Court said, we agree that there may have been breach of obligation, but it was not correct for you and the lower court that actually rendered decision in favor of the spouses to consider the breach as having committed by fraud. I mean, the Supreme Court, there was no fraud. Although there was contravention of the obligation. Why? Because the Supreme Court found out, number one, okay, the situation really was merely determined by the airline at the time when the final booking or the, the, when the final when the check in of all passengers was done, they discovered that the, that the uh, uh, business class was now fully booked and the necessity of, you know, upgrading the company. So there was no premeditated intention to really force them to first class, although they agreed to a business class. So it only happened. All right. And secondly, and secondly, all right, oh, it cannot be said that the couple was unaware of this. Why? Because they were members of the frequent flyer, Marco Polo frequent flyers club. They do have the brochures. They do have the conditions. They do have what you call now the amenities. And among them is clear in regard to the declaration that if ever there would be a booking that is fooled or filled up in a particular lower class, being members of the frequent flyers, they will be upgraded. So they knew about this contingency. And it was not just only at the moment when they were to go that they were made aware of it. There was a presumption of them knowing exactly the contents of the brochure which specified the terms and conditions of their being members of the Marco uh, Polo frequent flyer. So, was there a bridge? Yes. Was the couple entitled to that? Yes. There was bridge one, but not four. Rather, it was Kotoko contravention of the tenor of the obligation. And two, were they entitled to have it? Yes, but not to the tune of which they were initially granted by the lower court when it based its finding on the breach having been committed through fraud. Hindi daw kasi fraud ito, but rather it was you do merely go to. Okay, so we will now stop.